Welcome to the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast, episode number 142. Hi, I'm Jill. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm Chris. Jill and I are your hosts for this podcast and the founders of the Becoming Ellie community. We decided to name our community Becoming Ellie because Ellie was the Norse goddess of aging who beat Thor in a wrestling match. Chris and I thought, we want to be like Ellie. You can find out more about the Becoming Ellie community and this podcast at our website, becomingellie.com. And Ellie is spelled E-L-L-I. If you go to the website, you might notice a new way to support the podcast. It's called Buy Me a Coffee. Basically, it's a way to give us a nominal amount to help offset the costs of the podcast. Yes, thank you for supporting the podcast, whether it's by leaving comments, referring us to friends, or joining the Becoming LA private Facebook group. Speaking of the Facebook group, today we're talking to Diane Allen about her journey to health and her commitment to movement. Just to make things clear, in our conversation with Diane, we refer a few times to Danny Almeida, who is the co-owner of the Original Strength Gym. This is the gym that Diane uses, and we talked with Danny in episode 130. Let's go to the podcast. We met Diane Allen through the Becoming Ellie private Facebook group. She's always posting very motivational things about all of the great workouts and adventures she's doing. Diane works in education and used to be an AP biology teacher. Diane lives in North Carolina with her husband. She has four grandchildren and takes them on adventures now that she's able to do so. Like many of us, Diane had that midlife weight gain and corresponding health issues. When her doctor suggested bariatric surgery, Diane's daughter intervened and found them a gym and set Diane on the road to activity and health. Diane says, in the last four years, I've tried many new activities. Despite setbacks, physical exercise has greatly improved my mental health, my blood sugar, and my confidence. Welcome, Diane. It's so great to get to know you and to actually meet you. It's really an honor to be here. I've learned so much from your podcast over the years. You were one of the very first podcasts that I sought out when I started my movement practices. That's great. Thank you. Well, let's start with your story. I I know you said you gained weight, lost weight, gained it back. You developed some health issues, but maybe you can give us an overview about that. When I went through menopause, I went through it very suddenly. And it was also during a time of high stress in our life because of some parent, parental family, you know, your parents are aging, you're having to take care of parents. I had teenagers and a younger child. And at the time I was homeschooling and running a business and teaching. Oh my gosh. My cortisol, which now I know is part of the menopausal process, just went through the roof. And there were some pretty big fallouts from that. One is that I, developed really high blood pressure all of a sudden. So after a couple of years, the doctor was again, like the big thing at that point was my blood sugar was up into the above six and she made me mad. And so I found a nutritionist who specialized in athletics. And I was also rehabbing an injury to my knee at the time. And so between the nutritionist and the physical therapist, they were like, you've got to do something. You need to bike. So I started at the community center because it was like $10 a month and they had a recumbent bike and I could be on the bike. But when I realized I needed to burn about 200 calories a day, I didn't have enough time to be on that bike long enough to burn 200 calories. Well, that would take a while. It's more than an hour, really. And so I moved to a treadmill. And then I realized, well, I'm not dying. You know, I kept on. And then eventually, I joined a big box gym. And I also had tried Weight Watchers up a couple of times. In my younger days, I reached goal and maintained it. But after menopause, I mean, I went to the meetings, I ate the food, I kept the charts and nothing. Like it just, it was as if I was doing nothing. So the nutritionist was a a good resource to help tweak what was good, bad, or or not working. Beginning the movement helped. And honestly, the big box gym worked for about two years, maybe 18 months. 
I actually like a treadmill because I could watch a movie on the treadmill. That's how, like, I don't really enjoy physical exercise, but I remember I really improved my cardio fitness this summer. There was a TV show I wanted to watch that none of my family watched. So at nine o'clock, I would go to the gym and get my favorite treadmill and I would watch this show and I saw positive improvements. But when I took a job in a state department, the schedule, the stress, I tried to go to the gym close to work and it was too crowded. I couldn't keep up with my routine. So that's when I gained back the 20 pounds I lost and 10 more. And my blood sugar went south again. And that's when the doctor said, well, probably you need bariatric surgery. And she's been my doctor for a really long time. And that made me even more upset. So I did say, nope, I'll do nutritional counseling again. I did that. And that's when my daughter said, you people have got to move. She is an exercise science major in college and an athlete at a pretty high level. And she was really worried about us, genuinely concerned about her father and I. And so she found this gym in our town that's small and relatively innovative in its approach and made us sign up by threatening to get a tattoo if she, if we didn't start going. <laughs> so, and that worked for her dad. It really did. <laughs> and I'll have to say, I did not enjoy it. And I felt like I was going under duress. Okay. Even my coaches at the gym will go, oh, you were horrible. When you, <laughs> what? You were You were negative. You were like, you could tell you didn't enjoy it. Because it wasn't really your choice. You felt forced. Correct. And I I was being forced by my health and everything hurt. There was a lot of negative. And also, I wasn't comfortable. And whenever we're beginning to do something that we're not comfortable with, our natural tendency often is to find things wrong with it or to kind of halfway do it so you can say, well, you see, I told you that didn't work. I didn't know how to lift weights. I I kept saying, I missed my less meal classes. But now I realize in truth, I missed them because I wasn't half doing them right. I, you know, I, I wasn't pushing myself to an appropriate level, but I'm not a quitter. And I don't remember exactly what happened. But I decided, okay, before I just quit, I'm going to give this fall challenge. Every fall, we have a thanks living challenge. I love that. Thanks living. And part of one, and it's just five simple checkpoints a day, very simple things. But one thing is I gained an extra visit every week. I was on a minimal plan. So two visits a week and I gained that extra. And so I started going to a reset class on Wednesday evening, which is resets. If you remember, you talked to Danny Almeida about the original strength concept. So I, I won't go into all that, but resets really do positively impact your nervous system. And here was a whole 45 minute class. Think of it as like yoga for the not yoga people, because I could never do yoga classes. I can't balance. I mean, you want me to put my foot behind my ear? I don't, I'm not that flexible, (laughs) but the resets again, like most things start where you are and do what you can. And I literally cured my foot of plantar fasciitis simply by doing the specific stretches in the reset class. And I developed a more positive attitude, but my idea was I'm going to give it a go. Before I quit, I really, I I confess, I haven't really given it a try. And I began to appreciate the community in the gym, the exercises in the gym. Um, I began to feel better. And I think that when you start something and it's hard and you feel bad and it hurts, Sometimes that can be a lot of negative. So at the beginning, you have to have a little bit of someone behind you pushing you, someone in front of you encouraging you, and someone beside you helping you as you move through those times. And I found that during the challenge. And there's even a picture somewhere in one of the gym things where I'm holding a sign that says, I have found my groove because they said everybody has noticed that your attitude has changed. And that's about the time I started listening to your podcast, too. So did it become fun to go to the gym? Um, Not exactly fun to go to the gym. But here's what happened. There were two things. In education, we called this scaffolding. Like there were things at the gym I could not do. One of them was lay on the floor and pull myself up a rope. You know, like you're climbing, but we're not climbing to ring a bell. We're just thrown on the floor and you're pulling yourself up and then walking yourself back down. I could not at all do that. 
And also I was afraid of falling. I think somewhere in my past I have fallen during something like that and my body would just tense up. So the trainer said, oh, that's not working. I said, I just can't do it. You got to give me something else. That's just not working. He said, we're going to we're going to fix this for you. He put a bench there. He said, sit on the bench and just pull yourself up from the bench. It's hugely easier to do that. And I could be successful and then I could practice lowering myself. So that's a scaffold. You can't do this thing. So how can I make this thing accessible for you? Sort of start where you are able to do something and do baby steps to work up to something. Correct. Those baby steps. And then one day I'm dragging the bench over to do it. And he goes and pulls the bench. He says, you don't need the bench. I said, oh, I for sure need the bench. (laughs) He said, you don't just give it a try. Just just give it a try one time. And then I found out I could do it. It's not pretty, but I could do that. And that was a boost to my confidence. And then there's the, see, you can do that. But I heard something on your podcast that really resonated with me when you guys were talking about motivation. I wish I could remember which one it was. I've listened to a couple. I still haven't found it, but it was a simple statement. You said, sometimes you just have to think about the reward on the other side to get yourself to even start. And that resonated because that's what I use with students to like, especially to quit procrastinating. How did it feel that day you were stressing to get all of this done? It felt really bad. Would you like not to feel bad? Okay. And then you help them to accomplish one simple thing. How did that feel? Get in touch with your emotions. So I remember one day I was leaving the gym and I got to the door and I realized, oh, my knee, which was hurting an hour ago, is not hurting. Movement actually was helping the stiffness. And I stood there on the sidewalk and made myself list all the things that felt better. And I said to myself, I will remember how this feels. Because like a week later, I really didn't want to go out. It was kind of drizzly. It was a little cold and I didn't want to get sweaty. And I had to think, okay, I need to remember how it's going to feel when I'm done. And that got me there. Yes, that's impressive. It's profound. Yeah, to be that self-aware. But I think it's necessary to push through the hard spaces to remember you have a goal. And I'm in the, the fall challenge again, just to reset some of my good habits And I tell somebody, here's what I learned today, that I am 100% compliant if I can check a box at the end of the day. (laughs) If I am not supposed to have a Coke or a Diet Coke and M&Ms and I want to check the box, then I will walk right past all of that and get blueberries and a banana. For me, I think it's just part of my personality. I kind of need external boundaries and checks, but you have to develop the ones that work for you. Right. Do you give that check that list to someone or is it just for you? No, it's just me. I'm highly motivated by my own checks. I don't really, (laughs) I started the checks to show my doctor. Remember she made me mad. Yes. And so I started just keeping a regular calendar where I gave myself a green if I exercised for this many minutes and a yellow if it was for that many minutes. And I just left, there's no negative, there's just positive. So I just left it if I didn't. And I would write down what I did. And because she was like, you just don't like to exercise. I said, I want to show you what I'm doing. And I remember when she looked at my calendar and she's known me for 20 years, she said, that is phenomenal. You have really completely changed. It's not like she hasn't been telling me for 20 years, I needed to take care of myself. I just wasn't doing it. And sometimes it's a wake up call. Yeah. Yes. Your doctor saying bariatric surgery was like a giant motivator for you to avoid that. It was because I, I've i had several abdominal surgeries. And I also know that I've known people that had bariatric surgery and it worked well for some and others. They just seem to have a lot of unpleasant side effects. So I didn't want to deal with it. Another motivator for us with was watching our parents decline. My, I'll, I'll say my husband's parents were hard workers. We both grew up on farms and farm people work and they don't typically have a lot of hobbies because there's no time. So his parents literally worked into their 80s. And then when they retired, they, they were retired. So when you're retired, you sit around and watch Andy Griffin and Fox News or whatever. We saw that sedentary life impact them negatively in a very short period of time. And that was a little scary. 
because we could see we're, oh, we're doing that. We are spending a lot of time in front of the computer or spending a lot of time, re, you know, just sedentary, the sedentary. Also, one of my students in a project when I was teaching AP biology, she did a project and she came up with it. She found this phrase in this research. It said, sitting is the new smoke. Yeah, I've heard that. I was like, oh, okay, great. I've avoided smoking my whole life because we knew that was bad, but I have substituted sitting, which is just as bad. You said that you joined a small gym with your daughter and developed a passion for working out. Can you tell us about going there to get started and when you actually realized it was working for you? Was there a day that you can remember specifically? I think that day I stood on the sidewalk. Yeah. And I could feel better, that I felt better. Um, and all of this was over a, maybe a year because then COVID hit. And like, so it was like we joined in April and then COVID was the very next March. And so that fall of the Thanks Living Challenge, I also began to be more interested in doing things. Like if you suggested that I do this thing at the gym, maybe it was like you're planking and you lift an arm and a leg. And I was pretty sure I couldn't do it because I had never been able to do it. And suddenly, oh, I'll try it. I'll try it. And I could do it. And then someone um, suggested that I join the running club because we were training for this local 5K called uh, Run the Quay. Uh, the t- name of our town is Fuquay, Verena. And I just laughed out loud. I was like, I am not a runner. I am more of a cookie and tea girl. I am not a runner. <laughs> I don't remember someone a little bit older than I did said, you can do it. You just walk. That's all you do. You just walk. And so I did join that. And I really did not enjoy the training because it was early in the morning and it was cold, but I enjoyed the atmosphere. The other people getting to know the other people. Yeah. And everybody, the one thing about athletic and racing communities that I've seen is that everybody is positive. Everybody is positive and everybody is out for you. And you know, the phrase, you just run your race, girl, run your race. Don't you don't worry about my race. You run your race. Well, that very first trial run was to benefit the local high school. So it was a whole bunch of young people that finished in 10 minutes. And I brought up the rear with the person who's supposed to make sure no one dies on the course, like they're coming at the end. And when I got back to the last quarter mile, I could see my team. They came up and they ran with me. In fact, one of them said, there's a headwind. I'm going to get in front of you and you keep up with me, which was also a trick to get me to run because I was literally walking that race and I thought I might die. Uh, It was very uncomfortable. And then when I came around, they said, look at your time. You're going to beat an hour. And I did like I, I sprinted to get in under the 59 seconds flipping over. How cool is that? That's great. And the thing is, it was just my team there because everybody else was packing. They'd already gotten their medals and they were all going home. And that was a very positive experience for me that now I wish I could still run, but my knee doesn't actually like it. So I don't. You did a few races after that though, right? I did. COVID hit right after that. I did the race. My daughter got married. COVID closed everything down the next week. On my 61st birthday in April, my daughter and her husband were quarantining with us. They live nearby. And we just decided if we get sick, we all get sick together. This is like, this is just the way we're going to do our family, the four of us. They ran with me like a virtual race. We just you know, joined Strava, mapped out a race with very few hills, I will say very few. And she ran with me keeping the time and playing music and encouraging me. Um, And when I pulled around to the parking lot where we were supposed to finish, a group of people from our church and from the school had all gathered in their cars to blow their horns and cheer me on. And so that alerted the police and the police came to tell us there was no gathering in public. Oh, my gosh. So the laugh is that mama got busted on her 61st birthday. But in a way, it's a fun memory because I did that when it was important to me to do that race. And then I just I did a virtual quay run with my team. Again, everybody waited for me to come up that last hill because by then you could be outside with people. You just weren't supposed to be close. And um, I didn't do any more races until maybe the next year 
when my knee had really been a problem, but my friend was rehabbing from surgery and she was going to walk it. So she, she said, well, can you just walk with me? So I joined in the last four minutes of the sign up period and showed up the next day and walked that race faster than I had run the previous two races, which is also a testimony of just working out for a year, how much improvement I had seen. And it showed up in a, in a data-driven way. Your time is faster from walking than it previously was from running. That's great. Now, did I read somewhere that you're doing Indian club routines? Can you tell us what that is and tell us about that? Well, if you imagine pictures of women and even men at the turn of the century, and they hold these things like bowling pins, and so you swing them. Our gym had a big weekend event at and a woman named Kelly Manzone. So on Instagram, she's Kelsbells88. She came and did this training. And occasionally we had done some kettlebell things as part of our vitality routines in the gym, which are vitality is a small group class. And you move around stations, so you do different things. And occasionally, somebody would drag out those clubs. And I thought, well, that requires coordination. Um, I could be coordinated. But I, at the time, I had been reading John Ratey's book on um, exercise and your mental health, depression, anxiety. And he said that when you feel depressed and anxious, a repetitive activity will calm your nervous system down. So resets do that. But he was specifically talking about jumping rope. I don't like to jump rope. I didn't want to do that. Riding a bike. I don't like riding a bike on the highway. So I'm not going to do that. And running, which I would like, except my knee doesn't. So I was like, okay, I need something. And this opportunity came to learn from Kelly Manzone. So I went to the workshop and I did all of the things for about an hour. But when I got home, I realized my whole body felt relaxed in a way that is not typical for me. I tend to be a kind of a hard driver. I still have a fair amount of stress and I know physical activity has helped me deal with that, but I was looking for, I need something I can do right now because I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling anxious. And that really worked for me. So I am trying to practice some on my own and it relaxes my shoulders. Women carry tension often in their shoulders or their hips. Okay. And I can do resets for my hips, but my shoulders were constantly just quivering almost with tension. And those kettlebell, not kettlebell, but the Indian club movements, they relax those muscles. I don't know how else to explain it. It almost feels like magic. Wow. I hadn't heard of that before. Thanks for sharing about that. I'm going to look into that because I too carry a lot of stress in my shoulders and something like that would be great. What was the author who said the repetitive motion was good for... John Ratey, R-A-T-E-Y. The name of the book is Spark. Spark. There are a lot of books called Spark, but the Dr. John Ratey, his book on Spark, I think it's probably the most inspirational book about why you should have a movement practice because it's data driven. I I sort of like checklists and I like data. And if you want to tell me to do something, I want to know why I'm doing it. What is it doing? And how do I know it's working? So that book really hit all of those requirements for me. That's great. I like data too. So I get that. Were you athletic as a child or young adult? Um, I was not. I was active. I grew up on a farm. And in our age, you know, we played outside a lot. We, you know, swung from the rope, from the hayloft to the whatever. I mean, we rode our bikes around the farm. I never rode on a road and I still don't like to do it now. And I swam in the winter not competitively because I'm horrendously slow, but my mother was big on everybody needs to be a good, strong swimmer. And so she took us to swimming lessons. And from the time I was about 14, I went every winter to the local university to take some Red Cross life-saving course. I actually had quite a few life-saving things. Yeah. Swimming's a great way to get strong. It is. It is. And I'm glad that I did that because I've, I always have a comfort level in the water, even though now I'm years and years of not practicing anything. I was in the band. That's athletic. You're marching and playing all at the same time. Chris has talked about that. I love the band. I was in band for all those years. I loved it. What did you play? What instrument? 
I played clarinet. Okay. And um, that's a lot of wind. Sure. I tried it about 10 years later. I was going to demonstrate something in a class I was teaching and tried to play the fight song. And I, the kids were going, you're turning purple. Yes. Because <laughs> right. you, you lose your, your tone. Your armor shirt. Yeah. yeah. No, I know what you mean. I, I went back for an alumni reunion and I realized, man, I've been working out like crazy and I still can't do this. <laughs> you know. Yes. It's totally different. Yeah, it is. So what would you say are the advantages of being physically active? What improvements have you seen in your life? I mean, both physically and or mentally. Physical movement does actually improve your mental health. I know that. I know that it is something that I can tie to a tendency towards depression that has helped that. I know that something comes up with parental care or or something. I know that going for a walk helps me clear my mind. And those are tangible ways that I can hold on to that. When, before I started, before I lost weight, before I started any kind of regular movement pattern, I noticed that I could not clean a closet. I couldn't get up and down off the floor, really could not get up and down off the floor without holding on and pulling myself with my hands. I had had three abdominal surgeries, so I lost a lot of core strength over the years. I couldn't crawl around and clean the baseboards. I couldn't lift things and and put them high. And about two years after just working at OSI, I and OSI is the name of our gym, I had to help my mom move. And I realized, oh, I am doing all of these things that I know I could not do two years ago. And I was able to lift and carry necessary things, boxes of books, suitcases, working with my grandchildren or keeping up with the grandchildren. And we could hike again. When we were very, when we were younger, we hiked and camped. And after my surgeries in midlife, I remember my son trying to take us out on this hike to show a project he was working on. And I got a quarter of a mile and said, I'm sorry, people, I got to go back to the car. I can't do this. We have been able to hike in some of the areas that I would not have been able to hike before. I do use poles because they take a lot of pressure off my knee going up and down the hills and provide me with a sense of security. Another thing is, I think a friend of mine mentioned it. She said, I just feel, I can't remember the word she used, timid. She said, as I get older, I feel timid. I don't want to try this thing. Getting up on the ladder feels a little like, I don't want to do that. I might fall. And I could identify with a lot of that. But when I began to work out, I feel more confident, especially in trying physical things. With your balance, particularly? Especially with balance. I noticed it today when I went up and down our stairs, but because I broke my foot last winter, I was like, why am I still walking this? Oh, yeah, because I broke my foot and I spent three months in a (laughs) <laughs> in a hard boot and every, you know, you, you can lose. I thought, well, that's how quick you can lose that. I'm going to have to force myself to go foot after foot, like instead of just foot, step, foot, step, foot, step. I have to force myself to get that gait pattern back. But balance is huge. And I don't think we realize just doing core work will change your life in terms of walking, carrying, um, especially going upstairs. Improving your core strength improves your balance overall. Now, what's your favorite core work exercises? I mean, what what do you do to improve your core? I actually just took a little class called Core, and we did a lot. We did a lot of planking, and it was interesting that he showed us the right way to tighten your core. So that was one thing. It's like we tighten our core, but we don't really do it exactly the right way. So the trainer said, okay, we're going to do this. And he was fine tuning the movements. But when you plank, he's like, tighten your glutes, tighten your legs, tighten your toes, tighten your, you know, you're tightening all these things that normally you don't tighten. And when you do all of that, you couldn't hold it but 20 seconds because your muscles are under so much tension and they begin to shake. And he said, okay, now the reason we want to get to the shaking is because you're training your nervous system. That shaking means that you've stressed your nervous system enough that it's relearning. A, you're growing a neuron, basically. You're, you're strengthening a particular pathway. It took exactly three weeks, which interesting is about the amount of time it takes for your body to grow a good neuron, three to six weeks. And I suddenly took a step on the stairs and noticed, oh, 
I've tightened my core. And so I didn't have to like lean on the wall for support or hold the side. I could feel my whole body begin to like engage. My posture improved. I try to keep up with those planking, specific types of forward plank and then side planks and dead bugs. Dead bugs. Dead bugs. Yeah. Um, those things. I like to do Turkish get-ups. I think I wrote that on the line because now, especially if I'm using my core, it works my whole body and my hips. And it's like the quickest way to a full body workout is to try to do a Turkish get-up. But for fun, I would say it's paddle boarding. Paddle boarding, yes. Our gym started a paddle boarding class during COVID. When you could be outside, there was somebody that taught paddleboard yoga. And so she used to drive all of her boards down and the gym subsidized it. So we could go for practically nothing. And we were so tired of being in the house that a lot of us just went, you're going three times a week. I'm going three times a week. Oh, we'll go twice tomorrow. We can go to the four o'clock class and we'll stay for the five (laughs) o'clock class. And just trying to balance is enough of a core workout. But one day we were standing there getting all of the gear and moving our stuff around. And she started handing out anchors. 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 And so my friend Jane is a trainer, has always been a trainer. She and I were standing there and I looked at her and said, what are the anchors for? She says, I have no idea. So we said, what, what is this for? We've never used anchors. She said, oh, well, this is for yoga. We're going to anchor and you're going to do paddleboard yoga. And I just laughed. I said, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, I can't even do yoga on a flat ground with a mat and blocks. I, I mean, that's just impossible. She said, Oh, you're in it now. Just go on out. And Jane was like, Okay, well, in for a penny. So we go out. Sure enough, you fall in and you have to learn all the kinds of ways. Like, I don't do warrior on my feet, I do warrior on my knee because I'm not that good yet. But We did that once or twice a week for two or three weeks. And all of a sudden you feel like, oh, a lot of things got better. Now just standing on the paddleboard got better. It was a, it was more of a workout than we had been getting with whatever we were trying to do at home. So I know that when I am paddleboarding, I'm using a lot of muscles in unique ways and I'm getting in the sun and it's enjoyable and relaxing. Yes. That's great. One of the other things I I do want to say, because I am older, I've had to learn this year, I have this idea that if I don't go to the gym and just kill it the whole 50 minutes, that somehow I'm slacking. You're hard on yourself, aren't you? I am hard on myself. And it's taken a lot. Being injured was a big thing. But to know that today, my 100% might not look like yesterday's 100%. It depends on how I sleep and whatever else is going on in my life. And I've had to learn to take the breaks when I need the break and not to just push through because that stress can sometimes be negative on your body. And so going slower or having good recovery, I'm now trying to really practice better recovery habits when I work out to help, again, your nervous system has to kind of go back to baseline. To me, the goal is to build my resilience and that baseline actually has to, it becomes a little lower. It's like your stress level baseline gets lower and lower so that you can tolerate greater amounts of any kind of stress, whether it's at work or caring for someone or worry about something or you're sick or you're lifting more or whatever, being able to tolerate Um, greater amounts of stress. Because I think as we age, we have greater amounts of stress from different ways. My goal is to be as active as I can for until I die. That's my goal. So I've had to take off the plate. I'm not going to win any medals. You know, I'm not going to do things that would be very competitive in that way. I'm competitive enough with myself. And I am becoming fit and strong by practicing all of these good health habits. So I'm going to be the best 65-year-old I can be, and I'm in process somewhere. Well said. Why should women be open to trying new activities? Well, it helps our inner confidence, for one thing, and that confidence bleeds over into other areas of your life, not just your physical area. You might meet new friends. I've met new friends of all different ages. Uh, trying new things. You may not be able to participate at the same level as other people, but you can find a way to be part of the community. It improves all of the areas in my life that I'm trying to improve. You know, my sleep is improved when I try new things. I don't know why that is. It just 
Maybe it just gives me something else to think about. And I think the community is the biggest thing. You don't know where you're going to find your next friend. True. So I think we're all listening to Andrew Huberman's podcast, The Huberman Lab. And sometimes I have to say I find it a bit overwhelming, but... It is. I gather that you now use one of the non-sleep rest protocol of mindfulness and breathing that he talks about. Yes, I was introduced to Huberman and that breath practice by one of the coaches who kind of produces a, another little podcast, which is the Reader's Digest condensed version of Huberman's two-hour podcast. Oh. You can get all the highlights in 20 minutes. Because it's the over the hill athlete. But he came into the gym and said, I learned this thing today. We're all going to practice it. And it was about the breathing. And specifically at the end, original strength starts every um, vitality, every workout with the resets. Like you walk in and people are lying on the floor breathing, which threw me off when I first got there. Because, you know, I got an hour and I'm going to get all the work I can in an hour. And I don't know why we're lying on the floor. I need to get up and get to this. (laughs) lying on the floor and doing the breathing and the resets actually communicates to your nervous system that it's safe and puts it in a relaxed state so that it can do the things you're requiring it to do. Athletes sometimes call that like they're approaching flow when their nervous system is just set right. Well, he said at the end of gym, all of you just get up and leave. And so what you have to do is Now we're going to go back and we're going to do five minutes of resets and do the breathing. I wanted to hear all the data for that because that's like my background. So I listened to it and then I thought, oh, there are other topics here. So I've gone through. I don't I don't listen to all of them. I kind of pick the ones that I'm interested in. And sometimes I have to listen in, in 20 minute segments over several days to take it in. And sometimes I have to look up the show notes to see what I probably missed in the auditory. But he talked about sleep hygiene and the things to get better sleep, which is a big deal at our age. Yes. It's a huge deal. And he talked about the light, getting light in the morning and getting light in the evening. So I've added that to my, these are the things I try to do. And these non-sleep rest protocols are, they're basically like a yoga nidra, if you've ever done that. Yes. So it reminds me a lot of that. Without all the yogi stuff, you just focus on different parts of your body. You're doing breathing and specific patterns at different intervals throughout the exercise. And it has been shown to give your brain the same type of restful reset as a nap without napping. I tried this about a weekend ago. I was out of town helping with a wedding and I was really busy the whole week going up. And then that day and about two o'clock, I thought, people, I'm going to need to go to bed. I had not actually had been sick for a couple of days. And I thought, I am just fading. I'm never going to make the rehearsal at this pace. So I went back to my room and I thought, I'm going to pull up that sleep protocol because I've never done it. And like, I thought, okay, this is helping me. I had done it, but I thought, oh, that's helping. It's probably good. But I really paid attention and I really did it. And I'm, I don't think I dozed off, but if I did, it was just momentarily because then I woke up and I literally felt like I'd slept all night. It was that I could feel how much revived in energy I felt. And I was able to go to the rehearsal dinner and then drive an hour and a half back home at 10 o'clock at night. Wow. You know, I'm like, okay, I need to use this more. I need to find a quiet place at work that I can go sit and do this. And how long did it really take you to do that reset? About 20 minutes. And I, that's why I think I might have fallen asleep a little bit because they're not usually going to take that long. I think they're between 10 and 20 minutes, depending on who's talking the script. And I have to choose the person whose voice isn't irritating. (laughs) Right. I have a couple on replay. That's interesting. I know he talks about those a lot. And and he also will say if he is dealing with being awake in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep, he does that. Yes. And then he's able to go back to sleep afterwards. I am not a man. And so I find that even a little more challenging. But I do use it and I do typically get back to sleep, but it doesn't happen as quickly. If you get awake at three o'clock, I think you're in menopause. It's just something going on. It's the cortisol. It is the cortisol. 
it, but the, that's what the thing they measured with some of these protocols is they actually are measuring your cortisol and they find that it immediately lowers it. That was why I was interested in it. And I didn't want to have caffeine at three in the afternoon because that really messes up the nighttime sleep. And those protocols are, he had, they're on YouTube. I know he has a link to it. We could probably find it. You actually can Google it up. The last one I did was someone else. It was called Huberman, but it was someone who was on his show. And I just Google non-sleep rest protocol. And I'll put in Huberman to get the voices that I like because he has one that he does. And then this person who was on his show has one. They're almost identical. One is a little longer than the other. I'll have to look those up and link them in our show notes because that can be very helpful having that resource. It is. And another thing, he says it at the end of his, which I thought that I've never heard anybody else do it. He'll say, you can control what you think about because this whole non-sleep protocol is about think about your feet. Now think about your knees now. And at the end, he kind of reminds you this whole exercise was about controlling your thoughts. And if you're like me, sometimes you wake up and then your thoughts are running. It's like the gerbil on the treadmill. It's like, how do I get that stupid gerbil? Circling, yes. that circling problem. Yeah. Yeah. The body scans definitely get that yes. gone. Yeah. But I think it's good for our brain to remind our brain that I can control what you think about. And so adding that that little positive affirmation in is probably what turned me on to it to begin with. And you told us that you attended a workshop for Wim Hof breathing. Did I say that right? In cold therapy? I did. It was not with Wim Hof. It was with someone who is trained in his method. Again, our gym does a lot of reciprocal training. Like this person comes in and they're also an original strength trainer, trainer, but they're offering this. So I went. The breathing, again, is it's just another breathing protocol. I think you're pretty much hyperventilating. And I have not really followed that that's not been my path. But the cold therapy. Yeah. Tell us about what that is. Okay. It is not fun. That's the big <laughs> thing. We filled up a big ice tub and I don't really like cold like that. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to do it. But peer pressure is a very powerful thing. Yes, it and is. And so when my friend Jane jumped in that ice pool, I was like, okay, darn it. I'm going to do it. And I got in and then she like submerged herself. I said, oh, way to take it to the next level, friend. <laughs> and here we go. I'm not going to be sitting here alone. I'm going to get wet too. It was, I think we did a minute or two minutes and it, you're, it's just a will. It, you are willing yourself to stay cold. Honest to goodness. I, we had a little thing afterward. Would you like to have a cold protocol? Here's a little checklist. Can you do it this many days? And I did too and said, I really hate this. I'm not doing it. Well, what are the benefits to it? I mean, what, what was it supposed to do? That was, I, one of my physical problems is inflammation, inflammation from high cortisol, from stress, from who knows what else, but that's my body um, tends to respond with a, that inflammatory response. And cold therapy has been shown to help inflammation. And Huberman talks, he talks for two hours about this. So if anything you wanted to know about it, you should get the show notes. Talk about two uh, for two hours about a lot of things. Yeah, about a lot of things. It's definitely. I, I wish I could go to graduate school and listen. He's a fascinating lecturer, but you have to like take notes fast or get the download. So my son actually started doing the cold shower protocol, and he did it for the benefits for attention deficit disorder. He's in graduate school. We know we all have ADD, and we're all just learning to you know, work with it. And he said, mom, it would really help. I mean, it took me a minute to get to it, like stepping into a cold shower. But honestly, I feel so alert. I'm alert all day. It has really helped my anxiety. He's studying to be a counselor. So he was paying attention to all this. And he, his son does it like his seven-year-old. It's like a thing. If dad's doing it, I'm doing it. And they noticed that it helped him. In our, in this challenge, we each have a personal goal. And Danny tricked Danny is the my personal trainer at the gym, Danny Almeida. And she said, so tell me, have you ever followed through on the cold protocols, cold exposure? Pro I said, and I just sent back, ha, 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 ha. And she said, I want you to try this. 
like start now. It doesn't have to be real cold two or three times a week. Well, because I'm all or nothing, I've been doing it every day. And I'm trying to decide, is it a placebo effect or is it really real that I actually do have a little bit less inflammation in the places that typically are problematic for me? Interesting. I do. I don't know of a good way to objectively measure it. So I just And it's only been two weeks or a week. But I do find that I can tolerate it for longer. Like I'm up to 30 seconds once I get that water cold. And when I get out, I do feel a bit more alert and energized than typically I do in the mornings because I'm not a morning person. Do you just turn on the cold water and take and get in or do you take like a warm shower and then go to cold water? I enjoy my shower and then I steal myself to turn that water down and I get it. I like it goes down, 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 down. And I know where I'm only at cold water and our well is 300 feet deep. So the water is oh, really is that cold. cold. <laughs> it is cold. I don't know that it would support ice, but that's okay. Because what I learned from Huberman is if you really hate it that bad, you probably don't need five minutes. You probably are going to be getting good effects from it after 30 seconds. It's cold enough to take my breath. And that's how I measure when I'm going. The other thing I read or heard recently on another one of his things is when you're in the cold therapy, you practice the breathing that brings your nervous response down. So it's not just tolerate it. You actually intentionally practice this breathing to lower your stress response. And then you're getting the benefits of the cold, which activates your immune system, calms down inflammation, activates your attention, neurological pathways, but you're also learning, you're teaching your body a proper response to stress. Wow, that's interesting. I think I'm going to have to try that again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let let us know how it goes when you do that. Okay. Because right. misery loves company. Both Chris and I used Weight Watchers at some point in our lives for weight loss. And I said that I think it's the gateway process for losing weight or focusing on how you eat. And I know you said you used Weight Watchers and it worked for you at some point, but then didn't. So what did you use? What did help you get to a healthier weight? And I would have to say uh, my weight is healthier. I have lost 14 to 15 percent of my body weight without oh, that's medication. Good. That's impressive. And it, the doctor seems very impressed. It's not where I want to be, but I have other mitigating factors that might be influencing my kind of like I'm stuck here for a while. But going to a nutritionist who fine-tuned my diet and helped me be aware of how different foods were impacting my glucose response was hugely helpful to me. Also, counting the macros, which my current nutritionist isn't really about that, but I find it's helpful to me to have like the goals. That's because you like data and I goals. do like data, checklist and numbers. Yeah. So I can see where the macros would be appealing to you. Yes. And it is not any harder than keeping up with points to me. And it's way easier than keeping up with calories. With calories, you could eat a bunch of calories of the wrong stuff. Sure. With macros, okay, I've got to have 100 grams of protein a day. And that requires a lot of intentional planning to have that. Yes, it does. So that's what it was working with a nutritionist, which thankfully, most insurance companies will help you pay for a nutritionist because it's cheaper than paying for insulin later. So that I think that's been the most helpful thing for me. And I would recommend if you're at a stale point and Weight Watchers is fine. It is the community. It's the recipes. It's all the things you can do that. And if you ne- if you need to, however, it works for you is what you should do. Well, that's good advice. So do you eat now in any particular way, you know, like paleo or vegan or low carb? Do you avoid any kinds of food? I don't avoid in terms of never have. It's like nothing is completely off the table, but I'm very aware of the amount of added sugars that I eat a day and really work to keep that under 25. And I'm very aware of how much protein I should be eating. And I work really hard and hardly ever get to 100, but I get over 80. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you would just have to eat chicken all day to get there. I am an omnivore. 
I eat it all. And I have things that are my go-tos. I have intentionally substituted cottage cheese for some other things because I can have cottage cheese and fruit and that's really satisfying. And if I want a little bit of a sweetness, I'll drop in some dark chocolate chips. And then in the back of my head, I'm keeping up with, oh, that was this many grams of added sugar. It could just be because I like data, but I've seen it work for other people. When you start logging what you eat and you are intentional with it and you are honest with it, it is life-changing. And that's one of the things with Weight Watchers too, you learn to log. I do get worn out with logging sometimes, and so I'll take a break. But then every couple of weeks, I come back to it. It's an eye-opening thing, isn't it? It is. It is an eye-opening thing. And there's also this drift, you know, that half a cup becomes a quarter more and a quarter more, and then pretty soon... Portion control. Boy, that's that's my hardest thing. <laughs> it really is. You just have to weigh it out, or you have to weigh it or measure it, and then kind of make that a habit you come back to every now and then to keep that image in your mind. You know, one of the things that we've heard here on this podcast a lot is about putting, including protein with your snacks or whatever. Am I discovered recently, I don't know why I even did this because I don't normally eat cereal, but I bought a box of Cheerios, which I haven't eaten in years. And I ate the bowl of Cheerios and I was immediately hungry. It was like, oh, this is not a good snack because it did not at all it's satisfy not satisfying, me. Is it? I just no. was just like, I need to eat. <laughs> Yep. That's that sugar response that turns on in your head and you want more. And it's an insatiable monster. It really is. Right. I was like, I got to get rid of these Cheerios. It's hard to find snacks that have enough protein to me. I, I guess I don't have the right repertoire of snacks sometimes. Well, it's hard. I mean, you can eat like a cheese stick. Cottage cheese is sort of the an easy one to go to. I like that zero fat Greek yogurt because it does have a lot of protein. Yeah, and no sugar. It's got the zero sugar. Right. But it, it, you're right. It's hard and you can get tired of it too. So Well, that's you it. Add- it's you can get yeah. tired of. I mean, there's only ho- however many cheese sticks you're going to eat before you think there must be a better snack. <laughs> yeah, I I burned out on cheese sticks early. <laughs> you just have to have them on a rotation. It's kind of like your classes at the gym or whatever movement you're doing. You get bored with it and your muscles also get used to it. And so you need to change it up in order to shock everybody into like rebuilding. And I think that my appetite, I can kind of get used to things. And that's why the nutrition, I go, okay, let's change this up. Let's change the amount of this or that or the other and see if we can like get your body moving again. So do you have any advice on maintaining a weight loss? You cannot maintain it if you're not moving. Yep. You just can't. I don't know that I ate that much differently when I regained all of that weight, but I had stopped moving. What is the, it says you can never, it is also true you can't out-exercise a bad diet. Like they both have to happen. You've got to change your eating habits. And I think it's not helpful to think about a diet. Like this is the way I eat. Right. There's no going back to, I'm going to lose 20 pounds and then I'm going to go back to the way I eat because that's how you gain the 20 pounds. Yes. And I have intentionally avoided anything that had other people do that would promise more rapid weight loss, special foods or diets. For one thing, I didn't want to spend money I wouldn't eat and I felt like I wouldn't eat it. But also I knew when I quit eating that, I know it'll just come back if I don't actually change the way I do things. So that has been encouraging to me after what the two years, I can quit logging. And then if I just have a spot check day where I log, I go, okay, I'm still good. I'm still within this range. Or if I go to a wedding Like this past weekend, my daughter said, oh, you can have a bite of my cake because I know you probably don't want the whole piece. I said, I'm at a wedding and that looks delicious. I'm going to go have the whole piece. Absolutely. And so, but I, you know, made up for it. The next day I was kind of like, now today we're really going to not eat a lot of carbs. So I think that is the secret. You're just, you, it is a lifestyle change. And if you don't change your lifestyle, you will not change. And you can't maintain. You told us that at least 10 of your friends have been inspired by you to start 
their own health journey? And I don't say that with any pride. I really don't. I have been motivated. I told my friend Lynn, I said, your name's probably going to come up because I know my friend Lynn is a little older than I am and has a health condition that would probably have led to really, she told me one time, she said, they said 10 years ago, I'd be in a wheelchair by now. And here I am. And I'm telling you, Lynn can lift more than me and do a hundred Hindu push-ups or a hundred Hindu squats. And I'm like dying on the floor way before she gets there. So I look and go, if Lynn can do it, I can do it. And I think that then other friends who were just sedentary could see me, well, if this seems to be working, so I think I'll give it a try. Or if Diane can do it, I can do it. And that makes me happy. Like I have looked to other people and other people can see, because I'm not doing anything special. I'm just showing up and doing whatever I can, but trying to improve all along. Very nice. Well, Diane, I can't thank you enough. It's just, just been wonderful getting to know you and hearing about your journey. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I hope that anyone in my age bracket will take this to heart. Because the statistics for elderly people, I don't really call myself elderly, that's um, shocking, but the statistics for elderly people who fall are really high. And the number of people who die after a fall when they're older is even higher. And so if our goal is just to stabilize our movement so that we are not a fall risk, then that's good enough. Yeah, well, you you really captured so much of I know what I try to do with my health journey too. you know, a little bit taking the baby steps and trying new things. It really has made uh, a big difference. And I, I loved hearing about your journey as well. Yes. Well, I want to thank you for the podcast that you've put out. Like it's accompanied me on a lot of walks and it was an, an encouragement to me, especially when I started. If these gals can do it, then I can too. And it's been an honor to be here. It really has. Well, we're delighted that you were able to join us. So thank you. And we'll see you online. (laughs) Yay. Thank you. Talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Boy, Diane was inspiring. She's made some major changes in her life. I loved her openness in trying new things. Yes, I can tell she just uh, was a little hesitant to try that paddle boarding yoga, but it sounded like it was a great experience for her. And every time you try something new, you feel like a, another rung in the ladder kind of thing. Yeah, I I have to say I would be a little nervous about doing paddle board yoga. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to do just regular paddle boarding at first, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's hard enough sometimes doing yoga on your mat on the ground. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so after we talked with Diane, I tried the cold water thing in the shower. And I made it to 15 seconds before I decided, okay, that was more than enough. <laughs> I used the timer on my Fitbit to figure that out. So you I think just you probably count have to do the it. seconds. <laughs> yeah, to figure out the 15 seconds. I think you probably have to do it more than once to see the benefits, but I'm impressed that she has worked her way up to 30 seconds. Yeah, well, she said it's been two weeks too. So that's, you know, yeah. it takes a little while. And yeah. I I have to admit, I tried it. I don't think I made it 15 seconds. I, I just was counting too, kind of fast. It's like after a warm shower, that cold really feels cold. Yeah, it it. It's a shock to the system. But it is invigorating. Yes, yes. (laughs) And I know everyone talks about all these professional athletes and people you hear about. They all talk about the benefits of cold treatment. But but boy, it's a tough one. Yeah. Well, you know, different things help. You know, one of the things I really liked was that Diane said she hasn't reached her weight goal quite yet and that she's been dealing with injury, but she hasn't let either one define her. She keeps moving and trying new things. Um, Particularly, I liked her talking about doing core work, which is very admirable. The whole Turkish getup kind of thing. There's a picture of her doing a Turkish getup and that really works your core with the kettlebell. Those are hard. Those are very hard because it works so many muscles. I also liked how she talked about training her nervous system through a variety of different things. And um, I think that's really important and something that we don't really think about too often. 
No, no. I went and looked up the Huberman lab, the non-sleep rest protocol that she talked about, and it is on YouTube. There were other options too, but his was the first one that came up in my search. So I have not tried it yet, but... I haven't tried his version of that either, but it sounds a lot like Yoga Nidra, and I've done that uh, several times, well, more than several, uh, you know, to kind of reset my nervous system as well, along with some different breathing exercises. But there's a lot of different similarities and and differences between some of the protocols, but all of it working on your nervous system, I think makes a difference to get out of that fight flight kind of thing and get into that rest and digest nervous system. So I remember probably, oh, I was probably in my 20s and somebody gave me a cassette tape. Remember when we used to have cassette tapes to listen to things? <laughs> yes. All right. And it because I was having problems sleeping. It was a person voice and working their way through your body of starting with your feet and going to your head. It was incredibly relaxing. We did not call it a non-sleep rest protocol, nor yoga nidra. It was just here, <laughs> listen to this cassette and this might help. It was fantastic. So those kinds of things, whatever they're called, can really be beneficial. Yeah, I use some on Insight Timer, which is a free app. And a lot of them are called body scans, where you start at your toes and work your way up. I don't know. It's interesting. It is. So in the episode, Diane mentioned reset several times, but I don't know that we really defined it. I know it's about that her workouts, they start with a breathing exercise, which sort of ties in with what you were just saying about your nervous system and and dealing with stress and cortisol and all of that. But if you want to learn more about Reset or what she was talking about, check out episode 130, where we talked with Danny Almeida. I think that gives a lot better explanation than what I just said. Sure. And I'll make sure I link to that in the show notes. If you're listening and you want to share your thoughts on any of the things that Diane talked about, please post a comment or send us an email. You can find Becoming Ellie at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already done so, consider joining our Becoming Ellie private Facebook group. We'd love to have you join us. Diane belongs to the group, and that's how we knew she was doing such great things. It was wonderful talking with you today, Chris. I'm looking forward to our next episode of the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast. I am too. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.